So my plan is I'm going to pose some questions to the panelists and look for valuable and revealing exchanges uh, for the first 45 minutes or so. Then I'm going to turn things over to the audience. Now, I should actually warn you all the following. Um, I was on a panel about two weeks ago. Um, I had a lot of great questions. I would ask these questions, the panelists would answer something else. But, but, the, but, 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 but at least they answered stuff on interesting topics. So. So, so we'll see whether they find my questions interesting or prefer to talk about something else. But, we'll, but I'll, give my, I'll give this my best shot. Um, so anyway, I'm going to be, I'm gonna be talking uh, or asking questions for the first 45 minutes or so, hopefully generate some revealing exchanges. Then I plan on turning it over to the audience for questions. Um, I thought I'd start off by just quoting a blog post that, um, um, that Tommaso had with uh, Tobias Adrian. This is a quote. The adoption of new digital payment systems could bring significant benefits to customers and society. Improved efficiency, greater competition, broader financial inclusion, and more innovation. But it could invite risk to financial stability and integrity, monetary policy, effectiveness, and competitive standards. That's a real mouthful. Um, I think we're going to address some of these issues, maybe in a peaceful, uh, with a, in a bit of a piecemeal and, uh, and focused manner, but I, but I guess those are kind of the broad topics on the agenda. Um, I thought I would start off uh, uh, in part related to the um, first couple of talks today and, uh, and, and, and also to her, to her own experience to ask Catherine about what insights she might share with us about entry into this, into this kind of cryptocurrency and blockchain markets and what she sees in her own experiences there, and, and how does that jive with some of the conversations we had this morning? Catherine? Sure, sure thing. Um, and thank, thank you for, uh, for moderating. Um, looking forward to, the, to this discussion. Um, <clears throat> so, so I thought, um, I, I really enjoyed the, the first two papers uh, this morning talking about ICOs. I think um, when we talk about regulation, uh, thinking about uh, how to regulate ICOs um, is um, is always a topic of conversation on on sort of both sides. Coming from uh, uh, the folks who are um, trying to conduct ICOs and and trying to to raise money in this space, and also uh, from from folks on the, the academic side or and even on the government side. So um, so I think it's sort of important to to frame things with the perspective of like what is it that these these folks are trying to do. Now we know that. Um, platforms tend to have a lot of, of market power that, that they exert on uh, the participants in, in the marketplaces. And one of the, um, one of the key selling points of blockchain-based platforms is that they distribute the power, right? That you don't have some sort of central entity who's um, exerting control here, right? And that actually makes it extremely difficult to raise money uh, because you don't have the power that you need to be able to extract rents later, mm -hmm. right? So, so in fact, most of, um, most of the uh, uh, ICOs that, that I know about are ones where you don't actually have a monopolist who's later trying to sell a good or service um, in exchange for, for this token. You, they're trying to sell a token in advance that, that will be used to pay other people for services that are, that are going to be provided. And that's a much more complicated uh, setup to try to, to fund in the first place. Mm -hmm. So um, cryptocurrencies, they kind of serve multiple functions. They uh, provide a vehicle to support transactions. We think of that, that be, being potentially socially productive. They also attract attention um, as an opportunity for financial investment. Uh, does this create attention? And is this a, and and uh, both in terms of their own valuation and in, in terms of um, concerns, societal concerns that we ought to have. Um, either one of them go first. Uh, yeah. Um, well, so you pose this uh, this uh, dilemma in a sense. So, what are these currencies used for? Um, on the one hand, uh, potentially for investment purposes. Uh, on the other hand, for payment purposes. Mm -hmm. um, and those are two very, very different objectives. And you have, I think, very much a segmentation uh, among the currencies in their design uh, along these two lines. Uh, those that offer more volatility um, would obviously be more interesting as a vehicle for, uh, for investments. And then you have this new class of assets called stable coins, which, uh, of course, everybody's very interested in uh, now, which do exactly the contrary. 
limit volatility as much as possible relative to a, um, an existing unit of account. Mm -hmm. And um, that is something that, that we find very interesting at the fund. Um, essentially, the, the tokenization of fiat currencies. And uh, we can think about uh, almost an exchange rate between the stable coins and a popular, widely used unit of account. Um, and there are various schemes to try to limit the volatility of that exchange rate. Um, that is the, 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 that's the, the, the basis of the value, really, uh, the use value of these uh, stable coins. Um, maybe we'll, we can speak more about that uh, in, 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 the, in the discussion, perhaps. Okay. So, yeah, <coughs> so, so I, I think that it, it's stable coins um, and their, their development over uh, the coming years are, are going to be really important for um, the, the real utilization of, of the underlying technology. So as you say, having a lot of um, exchange rate risk or, or a lot of volatility in, in a token makes it sort of not a very attractive means of payment, right? And if the purpose is to facilitate market activity, if, if we're trying to get folks together who are going to buy and, and sell uh, from one another, then um, you know, having something that's very volatile is, is not very helpful. The, uh, another layer that I think is important to add is that um, in, in addition to, to um, sort of distributing power on the, um, on the, on the platform level, um, utilizing smart contracts to sort of automate some of, some of the payment is, is another component um, that has the potential to, to provide value or is sort of maybe a key promise of, of the technology. Um, but if you have a, a contract that's going to be sort of executed over time, um, or you might have a lag between when, uh, when the funds are paid into the smart contract and then when they're ultimately paid out, then the more volatile the, the currency, the bigger a problem is. So I, th I think that it's, it's gonna be really important to see the development of, of those stable coins and, and potentially, I'm, I'm sure that you'll have more to say about it, but potentially government ha has a role there um, to, to make sure that th that technology can, can be used effectively. So let me follow up a little bit on that. Um, so Issues about what determines the um, what determines the fiat money um, valuation. Fiat money is a quintessential notion of a of a speculative bubble. Um, it's uh, that notion of it can make its its values potentially fragile. On the other hand, um, what insights are different about this cryptocurrency realm to what we already think of when we're thinking about issues related to uh, fiat money more generally. Uh, what's special about this, or is this, or we just think about this as some other form of fiat money with the same type of issues in terms of exchange rate determination and, and the like? Yeah, I think that, ironically, <laughs> when, uh, when you think about the adoption of stable coins, um, adoption is, will be high to the extent that stable coins are similar to money, mm -hmm. to similar to existing forms of money. Yeah. And, um, but they have, so it, it, we can think about the store of value function and then the means of payment function of these stable coins. Mm -hmm. So in terms of this, and, and, and it's very, I think it's important to think about a hierarchy here. If you have a good store of value, if you are a good store of value, you may have a chance of being a widespread means of payment. The other way around is, is harder to think about. If you're not a, a, a safe store of value, uh, you will not be held for even that small second that it, that it is needed in order to do, uh, participate in an exchange. So in terms of the store of value, the stablecoin has to be very similar to uh, the established unit of account, to, to fiat currencies. In fact, that exchange rate should be as close as possible to one. Um, then we can think about the value of the stablecoin. Uh, let, let me just interrupt you there. So yeah. when you talk about that, do you have in mind back, explicit backing? Or yeah, so there, there, okay. so there are various schemes in order to ensure that exchange. Yeah. Um, and essentially, these schemes are, uh, rely on the backing of the stablecoin with uh, an asset that is uh, stable and liquid. Mm -hmm. um, so there can be a whole range of assets. Uh, the most stable and liquid assets uh, would be a cent central bank reserves. So we can think about a class of stable coins that are fully backed, so coins that are fully backed with central bank reserves that are especially liquid 
especially uh, safe. Then we can think about you know, the next class of stable coins, which would be backed with government securities, perhaps uh, CDs of highly rated banks, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we can think about a spectrum of assets uh, in terms of safety and liquidity that back these stable coins. Um, I think it's very important to think also about uh, the type of contract that this stable coin represents. Uh, so do you, as holders of this stable coin, have a claim on the underlying assets or on the issuer or not? That's bound to be very important. Because what is important is your ability to redeem these coins. So if you put in $10 to buy the coin, when you redeem the coin or when you exchange a coin, what are you going to get back? Are you going to get back the same $10? Or are you going to get back more or less? Um, so if the, coin has, um, if the coin issuer guarantees redemption at face value, uh, and has the capacity to honor that guarantee, either by holding very safe and liquid assets or by holding enough capital, uh, that makes it a pretty safe coin. Uh, if instead there is no redemption, there's no notion of redemption at face value, there's only a notion of redemption or exchange for the going market value of the underlying assets, then you're holding something that is very, very different in nature. You're holding essentially a uh, tokenized share of a security or an investment scheme. That makes it a completely different type of asset, really, that unfortunately is often bundled, is often, is often portrayed under the same umbrella of stable coins, but in terms of the riskiness to the user, it's completely different. And in fact, we can, I guess we'll talk about this later, but also from a regulatory standpoint, it's completely different. Uh, so, so one piece that I would sort of add, add on to this or, or draw out of, of what you said is, is that um, it, it matters both whether the, um, the value of the coin has potential to go down and also whether it has the, the potential to go up. And if we're, we're trying to issue some sort of currency that will be used to buy stuff, then it's actually important that the value doesn't increase too much, so the purchasing power isn't going up, because then people want to save it instead of spending it. Um, and uh, so, so this is a result. So actually, I will, I will give a shout out to, to Josh Gans here in the audience. Um, I, I absolutely love uh, uh, Catalina Gans. Um, so this is something that, uh, in, in my experience uh, with, with clients, with investors in, the, um, in this industry, Folks don't understand that if you have a coin that has too much appreciation, it will not be used as a means of payment. Um, and so uh, that, that creates a big challenge for, um, for folks who are simultaneously trying to launch a platform where you have a marketplace and, someone is, and folks are using this uh, coin to buy and sell goods and services, but also you need to somehow raise the money to be able to launch that, that platform in the first place. And so most of the um, folks that I've talked to in startups and, is, and also uh, investors that I've talked to in the space want a coin that's going to appreciate over time, um, but obviously um, that, that can cause serious problems if you're uh, actually trying to get a functioning marketplace. I think it goes back to uh, Lars's, your, your initial uh, view right. of you yeah. know, either an investment coin mm -hmm. or a payment coin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we uh, have for many decades thought about exchange rates and, and theories of exchange rates and, and characterizing empirical behavior of exchange rates and like this. Um, Issues about cross-currency uh, cross speculation come into play and the like. Um, and, and, and the rut of price of these exchange rates is an additional source of volatility as well. To what extent do issues like this carry over? To what extent the insights we know from exchange rates uh, of existing current, uh, of, of kind of fiat currencies from governments is going to carry over to the space of trying to understand the rut of valuation of the various different um, mm. um, cryptocurrencies or, or, or maybe more narrowly defined and entities here. Right, right. So um, I think that in my mind there are two notions of exchange rates. One we already discussed is kind of the exchange rate between the coin and an established unit of account. Right. That can be dealt with in, yeah. uh, with the design of the coin. And then of course there's the issue of the exchange rate with other um, uh, fiat currencies. And yeah. 
to the extent that a stable coin is perfectly anchored to an existing fiat currency, then of course the exchange rate with other fiat currencies should follow more or less the same dynamics. But w one thing I've been uh, th starting to think about, I don't have any answers and maybe we can speak about this uh, together, discuss this together, is the, is, is the market structure. Uh, the market structure may change. Uh, we have very, very efficient um, platforms to trade uh, fiat currencies, CLS, et cetera. Um, the question is uh, what type of platforms, or what type of market structure exists to trade uh, tokens? Assuming that these tokens are perfectly uh, anchored to uh, existing fiat currencies. And if this infrastructure is much more uh, fragmented, uh, we may get different pricing uh, and potentially arbitrage opportunities. Uh, with the trading of, of fiat currencies, um, with the exchange rate of fiat currencies. So I think this is an open question, but we should think harder about the market structure and the fragmentation of the trading of coins across currencies. Okay. Um, so, Tomaso, I'm going to pick on you a little bit. Um, in this blog that you wrote with... Um, P.S. Adrian, you, uh, there's a couple of statements here I'm going to lift out of context, no doubt, but I'll do it anyway. You say that banks may lose their place as intermediaries, but they will also have incentives to compete. Th th these are things that, at least in your uh, blog, look like there might be potential problems, at least, at least issues. So, so banks may lose their place in, in terms of intermediation, or also they're going to have to make some important adjustments. Weaker currencies uh, may could face threats. Local currencies should be shunned in favor of so-called stable coins. I see these, and why isn't competition good here? Why isn't the fact, don't we want banks to uh, reduce their cost of intermediation through co you know, competition? And maybe this is a very good force. In terms of you know, countries that are running these un, you know, you know, really wild monetary policies leading to their currency you know, uh, um, values moving all over the place, wouldn't it be healthy to have these uh, outside threat to those things in order to discipline more of the monetary authority, right. authorities in these countries? So why are these, these, these seem to me like good, th good, good outcomes, not bad ones. Right, right. Um, yes, I mean, you're right, and this is probably what you would expect here in this, uh, <laughs> at the University of Chicago. Um, I think that, <laughs> don't blame me. Uh, it, it's a great honor to be able to speak here. It's a great honor. Uh, I, I think that, and, and we can speak perhaps later or, yeah, or not about the, the specific uh, dynamics of uh, disintermediation of the banking sector or mm -hmm. dollarization of economies. But to get at your question of competition, I think that the main concern is the transition. Uh, well, for banks, I think the main concern is the transition dynamics. So what if there are very, very rapid movements out of bank deposits into stable coins? What happens to the banking sector and does it have time to adapt? And what are the potential implications on the provision of credit? We can speak a little bit about that as well. Uh, but let me just finish on your initial question. And for countries, I think the, the main concern is kind of hysteresis effects. Um, first of all, countries already have competition for their domestic currencies. And mm -hmm. usually it's in the form of the dollar. Um, Argentina and others uh, with countries with high inflation, volatile exchange rates uh, are already pretty highly dollarized. The issue is that, of course, holding dollar uh, assets in these countries is relatively compl complicated and expensive. You either have to stash dollar bills under your mattress, or in some countries, you can hold dollar bank accounts. But of course, transferring dollars uh, to the merchants or to peers is very expensive because often these transactions need to be cleared by US banks. And so the possibility of holding a dollar-backed asset, like a stable coin, uh, and being able to trade that at very low cost using your phone, being able to go down the street and buy groceries with that coin, uh, might induce a discrete jump in the level of dollarization in these countries. That's, of course, a concern from the public policy standpoint, loss of monetary policy control, financial stability, et cetera. But, and you might say, well, but people will benefit, right? These people are losing out uh, because of the inflation tax. The problem is, of course, if you get a very a high you know, a jump in dollarization in these countries, and suppose in the next, that happens in six months, and in the next six years, you get a discrete improvement in policy, and policymakers get their act together, et cetera, you might not come back to the use of the domestic currency. You might just stay with the equilibrium of using the dollar. That, that's what I mean by hysteresis effects, and that's the worry. So again, I think the worry is similar 
It's about the transition, the speed of change, and not being able to adapt to that speed of change. It does seem like the threat of um, bad th things happening if you misbehave is a very important disciplining device. So it's, 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 it seems like we should not shy away from that too much here. But no, um, anyway. I, I agree with that. I agree with that. <laughs> and I, you know, if, if thanks to this, we all get higher interest on our deposits in the banks, and that if deposit yeah. rates move more with policy rates, yeah. it means that better transmission of monetary policy, all yeah. of that is very good. Yeah. So Catherine, in your business, you see uh, private sector challenges to governmental insights, and you, which, you know, the previous paper was also discussing some of these challenges as well. Um, in terms of regulation, um, a question that comes up is whether digital currency should be viewed formally as a security, um, exactly what type of oversight should, uh, is it subject to? Um, more generally, how pronounced are the regulatory challenges, the uncertainty faced by the private sector uh, in terms of these oversights, and, and what impact does this has, have on entrepreneurial activity in this area? Oh, gosh. That's, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to uh, sort of piece it out uh, into, into a few um, different topics. So, um, so I think that this first point is just that um, uh, there's a lot of promise in this technology, and we want to actually see it get developed, mm -hmm. and that there are real challenges to figuring out how to fund it, as I mentioned at, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, now, and, and then you sort of build on top of that, that many of these folks who are, who are trying to do token sales want, think that the, the way to do it is to have a, a token that's going to appreciate, because mm -hmm. that will draw investors to actually give them th this money. Mm -hmm. And I think that you sort of, there's some problem there. there there's something that's yeah. not that's yeah. not adding up to um, a, a well-functioning technology that's uh, fulfilling its promise. Yeah. Um, that being said, I mean you you could potentially um, try to you know see you could potentially see platforms launching that try to implement a, a monetary policy that um, that allows the um, the coin to be stable or stable-ish. Um, once the, the platform is launched and the marketplace is operational, and those coins are sold at a discount uh, upfront, uh -huh. right? So I, I think that, that that would be like the most the most promising uh, way to, to actually fund this. Now, then you 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 sort of still have all of the the problems regarding um, uh, uh, the usual reasons why you would you would see an entity like the SEC involved. So. Um, there, there is actually a lot of fraud. <laughs> there has been uh, mm -hmm. over the past couple of years, uh, and and you want to protect those who, who are putting their, their money into this. So so the question is, okay, how do we do that? Do we want to use uh, the kinds of regulations that have been uh, pre-existing? So do we want to restrict uh, investors uh, to to um, to only qualified investors um, uh, uh, who sort of have the the um, uh, right amount of, of capital and know how to, to vet these these kinds of projects, or do we want to allow retail investors in um, on the ground floor? Now, I think that um, you know my sense from talking to a lot of projects in the space is that they all want retail investors to to be involved. Now, I won't say all. I would say many, many of them want retail investors to be involved. Um, and I think that the the um, the rationale behind that is that well, you know. I, I want folks to participate in the market that I'm launching, and so mm -hmm. it's important to get the tokens or the coins in the hands of those consumers. So I, I want these to be retail investors as opposed to um, to larger investors. Um, but I, I, I think that you know uh, there's a lot of, of anecdotal evidence, at least, that should make us concerned about. Um, the ability of retail investors to discern between um, real projects and, and projects that are, are fraudulent. So I think that, um, you know, I, I certainly think that there is a role for, for government to step in yeah. and that, um, you know, having government play that role um, can be beneficial for the, uh, for, for the real projects or the projects that are, that are actually attempting to, to push this technology forward, you know, clear out, um, Clear out the fraud, clear out the mm -hmm. junk, and and sort of let the um, uh, let the technology thrive. Mm -hmm. Lawrence, can, yeah. can I pick up on this point of, of regulation? Yeah. Um, you were asking, how, you know, how are these, how should these coins be regulated? It, it's a very big question that both entrepreneurs and regulators face, and that is how to label uh, these coins. Mm -hmm. um, 
And the debate is really about whether these are some sort of form of e-money. So, so not every jurisdiction has uh, a notion of e-money, a legal notion of e-money. The US doesn't, the Europe does, for instance, the Euro area does. Um, is it e-money or is it an investment scheme? And if it's an investment scheme, is it a security, is it a commodity, is it something else? Yeah. How you label these coins makes a big difference in terms of then how you regulate them. And of course, how you regulate them makes a big difference in terms of adoption. Uh, if you're a security, it's going to be very difficult to trade the token between peers and certainly across borders. One of the big, uh, big reasons for these coins is to be able to facilitate payments across borders, right. which are very expensive and slow, et cetera. And if, it's, if there are securities, it's going to be very difficult. I think the test is, it comes down to what we were saying before, is kind of this, this notion of the exchange rate you know, between the coin and an ex established unit of account. So if, if your coin is denominated in a unit of account, has a face value in that unit of account, and the redemption is there's a guaranteed redemption at face value, it's e-money. Essentially, the risk, any risk, is borne by the issuer, not by the holder of the coin. That's e-money. That is treated from a regulatory perspective in a very different way than if it were uh, what we call investment money, um, which, which would be that you are denominated, perhaps in an existing unit of account, perhaps in something else. Your denomination may be, may be an ounce of gold or maybe uh, a basket of currencies. Uh, then uh, the question of redemption there is when you redeem, what do you get? Well, you get the underlying value, the, the value of the underlying asset, um, which moves around, which is volatile. And that's much more of, uh, of an investment product. Mm -hmm. So you can see that design of these coins is going to be very, very important for how they're labeled. How they're labeled is going to be very important for regulation, and regulation is going to be very important for adoption. Um, there is an acute need, I think, for greater clarity uh, in terms of how these coins are labeled. What are the criteria? What are the relevant criteria to label these coins, either as e-money or as investment schemes? It's, I think, a responsibility of policymakers uh, to act quickly and across countries provide a clear definition of those criteria so that entrepreneurs can also figure out how they're going to design their coins. Um, and how would that will drive adoption? So, a couple of things come to mind when I'm hear, hearing you talk about this, um, about regulation. One is, um, many decades ago, Friedman, Milton Friedman was writing about monetary policy, and he started talking about long and variable lags, and we should design simple policies because, because we didn't fully understand the monetary transmission mechanism. If we tried to per, uh, overstate our knowledge base, we, would, we might cause more harm than good. I'm also reminded of the financial crisis when it first happened. I would go to conferences, and there'd be central bank, uh, bank research people there, and they'd, and they'd say, well, this, this is a really complicated problem, how to do this financial regulation. Therefore, it requires complicated solutions. I'm, is, is this another place where, where, yes, it might be a complicated problem, but a complicated solution might actually get in the way, as opposed to uh, so what's really feasible here uh, in, terms of, in, in terms of the regulatory process? I mean, it's, it's nice to look to the government to solve a bunch of problems, but is there a way to do this that uh, doesn't really overstate our knowledge base and is actually feasible for, for, uh, for governments to do? Right, right. I, uh, yes, that's, that's a wonderful uh, question. <laughs> You know, you don't get such depth of questions in most panels. <laughs> um, I, I think that you are right. <laughs> this is, no, it, it's, it's, it's this man over here. <laughs> um, yes, I think you're right. And the complexity in regulation comes from these coins, of course, being available across countries. Uh, but also uh, the ecosystem that is necessary to have these coins put into place. So the ecosystem consists of, and, and the ecosystem is a variety of entities that are you know, legally different. Uh, so you have wallets, you have exchanges, you have market makers, you have the issuer of coin, you have um, um, wh where you deposit uh, the coins, etc. How do you regulate all these entities? Uh, who is responsible for governance? Who is responsible for uh, compliance with AML, CFT, et cetera? Uh, not only across these entities, but across countries. Extremely complex regulatory problem. I think one of the justifications for central bank digital currencies uh, may come from exactly this, this idea of you know, how do you simplify things? So 
there's a whole debate, and, and you know, some among you here in the room have, have been uh, uh, prime contributors uh, to this debate on central bank digital currencies, and there are various ways to do this, right? One way is for the central bank to pick a technology, issue the coin, regulate it, interface with customers, put out a 1-800 number that customers can call if the coin goes wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty expensive, pretty risky for the central bank. Another way is <clears throat> what we've coined synthetic central bank digital currency, which would be let the private sector innovate, let the private sector create the coins, interface with the customers, et cetera, but require the coins to be fully backed by central bank reserves. And if you do that, you essentially create a structure where the holders of the coin are nearly holding and transacting in a central bank liability. <coughs> nearly, because of course they're doing so through the intermediation of the coin issuer, but you can isolate the coin issuer from, uh, you can isolate the, the, the holder of coins from bankruptcy risk through uh, trust uh, mechanisms, for instance. So the, the holders are essentially holding a transaction in a central bank liability, pretty safe, pretty liquid. Um, from a consumer protection standpoint, you know, pretty clear, pretty straightforward. Uh, the central bank can require the issuer of coin to uh, satisfy certain criteria, technological, uh, safety, security criteria. Maybe that is a way to simplify uh, the world and to offer users a very safe and very liquid digital means of payment. So, um, so I, th I think it's important just to, to add a little bit of clarification here because there's two different concepts that, that um, we've been talking about throughout the conversation and, and they aren't interchangeable. So, um, so one is sort of thinking about um, stable coins and, and how we can facilitate them and um, uh, how, how they should be regulated. Um, but that, and that's different from sort of um, the, the investment piece, right? In particular, uh, you can't have uh, a fully backed stable coin that uh, that folks raise money off of, right? So <laughs> some, some so you can't you know add up to one, right? We have a problem there. So uh, um, and and many of the the um, uh, um, parties that that conducted ICOs over uh, the last two or three years um, didn't you know there's no backing of anything, right? And and there's no uh, guaranteed claim on anything. Right, so the, the coin is supposed to be used eventually, hopefully when a platform actually launches and you'll be able to bring that coin to pay some third party uh, vendor or to pay some miners on that network, um, but, but you don't have the right to, uh, to, to any uh, particular redemption value or any claim. Um, and so certainly these two things need to be regulated much differently. Um, uh, and you know, I, I think uh, it's it's still a bit up in the air about um, you know what what should a, a digital currency look like, and, and should these two things be allowed to, to coexist together? Is there a role for each of them? I don't have an answer to, to those questions. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fine. Um, so let me follow up on something here. So I, and again, let me just just to get us going quote something from your blog that says, policymakers must reinforce consumer protection in order that customers' funds be safe and protected from, from the runs. I, I keep on wondering, again, are we asking the government to do too much here? And I mean, in some sense, why should the government be, I mean, suppose there's like runs on some uh, cryptocurrency that isn't, uh, that's not issued by the government. I mean, why should we? Why, should we, why don't we just tell, you know, warn investors this might happen and if they're concerned about it, they can just stay out of the market. I mean, why do we have to get involved in that? Why should the government get involved in that at all? Um, what should be the, um, beyond some form of informational provision? Um, participants can always avoid these run possibilities. Uh, maybe they spill over to other markets. Maybe that's the biggest concern. I'm not quite sure. But um, it just seems to me, especially given the internet, given the cross-country challenges here, kind of uh, um, uh, ask, us being overly concerned about the stability of these type of markets, I, yeah, unless we're convinced it's going to have major spillovers, why should it be a big issue? Why, why should we just let it go? And, uh, and investors want to participate in this and get burned, and then they'll learn from it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, one analogy may be uh, constant net asset value funds uh, that promise a certain uh, redemption um, to users. Uh, that, I think that, that's the right analogy for stable coins. You're, you're guaranteed to be able to exchange these coins at face value. 
uh, that guarantee uh, needs the, the issuer needs to be able to honor that guarantee. Yeah. Um, and if you have full disclosure of information and everybody knows exactly what are the assets behind that uh, coin and can evaluate the probability of that guarantee uh, being solid, fine. You don't need regulation. But to the extent that there's not perfect information, you probably need uh, some regulation saying that you know, the assets have to be of a certain quality, the, the uh, capital needs to be sufficient in order to absorb potential losses. Um, so you certainly need information disclosure uh, regulation, and you yeah. probably also need uh, some additional regulation uh, in terms of the assets that can be held, or perhaps just in, you know, relative to the capital. Why is that information that is disclosure enough? I can understand that part of it. Um, I think that we've we've seen in practice that it's you know it's not sufficient uh, when you look at. Uh, net asset value funds that broke the buck and that induced a, a, a massive run. Um, and when you, when you know that there are externalities from uh, those runs in terms of prices of the assets that might be sold in large volumes. So again, you know, all of this becomes much more pressing if these are very, very large uh, in scale. If these are very small in scale, the financial stability implications would be much lower. Yeah. But, uh, if a large provider such as Facebook or other uh, companies with very, very large installed bases gets into this space, uh, you might imagine that if there were a run on such a large fund, it would have negative spillover effects on uh, other asset prices. But, but there are incentives for you know, Facebook or, or whomever to protect themselves against runs in a sense. So that, I mean, there are private incentives to uh, um, are, for some of these entities, and so the presumption here is that those private incentives are not those private incentives are not enough. And so, well, yes, and, you know, there's, yeah. there's also a question of uh, time frame over which these uh, mm -hmm. incentives uh, hold. Yeah, relative to the social optimum. Yeah. With that, I'd like to thank both of the panelists for doing such a great job of answering our questions, and uh, well, I guess we're out for a break. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.